Good morning, church. Good morning. It is good to see each and every one of your faces here today as we come to worship our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus. My name is Amanda, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Millington First United Methodist Church, and we are grateful that you joined us for worship today. As we were talking about in youth group with some of our youths here on Sunday school, uh, this is the first time it's raining on a Sunday in a while, and I think we feel that too. But we are grateful whether you're joining us from home or you're here in person to be united in our spirit, whether we are near or far from one another. May God's spirit touch each of us and offer grace and peace this day. I have a few announcements I'd like to share about what's happening in the life of our church this week and in the coming month. Today we'll celebrate communion together, and you are welcome to come and participate freely, recognizing that this table does not belong to our church or to the United Methodist Church, but this table is God's table, and all are welcome, for Jesus has prepared a place just for you. As you come to receive God's gift of grace and love through communion later today, you'll also be uh, invited to leave an offering on the communion rail that will move towards our local missions here in the community. This helps uh, supply the fund through which we meet immediate and emergency needs for our neighbors who call, most often providing emergency shelter at one of our local hotels for someone experiencing crisis homelessness. So as we reach out beyond our walls, we give thanks to God for the many opportunities to be the hands and feet of Christ in real and practical ways. You'll also note that due to the holiday week weekend, tomorrow on Labor Day, our offices will be closed, but we'll be back here on Tuesday for whatever needs that you might have. We also have many meetings happening this week. Our Joy Circle, Men's Bible Study, Food Pantry, Anna Circle, Young Disciples, Choir, and Youth Group. Lots of activity going on. So if you're already part of one of those groups or you've been thinking about joining one of our uh, women's circles or the men's Bible study, please look for the details in our bulletin today and make this the month that you get back into the swing of things as we uh, welcome the fall season. Lastly, I'd like to share with you that throughout the month of September, we will be collecting items needed by Golden Cross Ministries. Those items include things like coffee cups or mugs, puzzle books, microwave, oatmeal or popcorn, lots of different things that make the lives of our neighbors who live in Golden Cross Senior Living Facilities just a little bit easier. And we are grateful to have Millington Towers just down the road from us and look forward to sharing these and more resources with them. If you're interested in meeting some of those needs, you can find a more detailed list in our bulletin about uh, what Golden Cross uh, residents say they need in their homes. Friends, as we come together to worship God, we give thanks for the rain that renews the earth, as we give thanks for God's mercy that renews our souls. May we find peace in God's presence today as we come to worship.
as you are able as we join together in our call to worship. We'll read responsibly, and you can find this in your bulletin and project it on the screen. Every generous act of giving is a tribute to God's love for us. Lord, let us be people of generous and abundant gifts for others. Be ready to listen and slow to react in anger. Lord, prepare us to be peaceful people. Keep your hearts and spirits ready to serve the Lord. Lord, open our hearts to hear and respond to your words of life in ministries of hope and peace. Amen. Good morning, and thank you, Elizabeth, for that beautiful prelude, Be Thou My Vision. Our hymn of praise this morning is Great Is Thy Faithfulness. can be found on page 140 in the United Methodist Hymnal, or the words are projected on the screen. We'll sing all verses. Of the body 
and the life everlasting. Amen. by his true word, 
and here is the result. We are like the first crop from the harvest of everything he created. Know this, my dear brothers and sisters. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to grow angry. This is because an angry person doesn't produce God's righteousness. Therefore, with humility, set aside all moral filth and the growth of wickedness and welcome the word planted deep inside you, the very word that is able to save you. You must be doers of the word and not only hearers who mislead themselves. Those who hear but don't do the word are like those who look at their face in a mirror. They look at themselves, walk away, and immediately forget what they were like. But there are those who study the perfect law, the law of freedom, and continue to do it. They don't listen and then forget, but they put it into practice in their lives. They will be blessed in whatever they do. If those who claim devotion to God don't control what they say, they must lead themselves, and their devotion is worthless. True devotion, the kind that is pure and faultless before God, is this, to care for orphans and widows in their difficulties, and to keep the world from contaminating us. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? Will you pray with me, and will you pray for me? God of love and grace, this morning we hear from Scripture that every good gift comes from your hands, and we are grateful for the many ways that you have provided for us in our lives. From the breath you gave us this morning to the wisdom you offer for the living of our days, Lord, we pause today to give you praise. As you continue to pour good gifts out upon us, God, help us sustain our inspiration and energy for acts of faith. Acts of faith that change this world into your kingdom of heaven. Acts of faith that lean into the goodness you offer us in this life. Acts of faith that we offer to you in gratitude for your love and your faithfulness. God, we pray that in this time together, as we consider your word and your message, that our lives might yield a full harvest of goodness and compassion and our relationship with you, with one another, and with the community. God, help us learn what it means not only to hear, but to do your word of truth, that our lives might honor you. And now, Lord, I ask that you would draw me beneath the shadow of the cross, that what is heard today are not my words, but yours. And what is felt in all of our hearts are not our own desires, but your will, O oh God, for you and you alone are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. If you remember any verse of scripture by heart from the book of James, it is probably not one of the verses that we read this morning in our passage. Probably the most well-known or memorable verse from James we'll hear next week comes from chapter 2, verse 26. Faith without works is dead. And though you may not have heard these famous well-known words today, this same message of an active faith is written throughout the whole book of James. The simple audacity on James' part to proclaim that if we believe in Jesus, then something about the way we live our life, the choices we make, the actions we take, should change, should be different because of the faith we have in Jesus. The book of James is unique in our New Testament canon. Unlike Paul's letters written to specific communities or the Gospels that tell us about the life and ministry of Jesus through miracles and parables, James offers us some no-nonsense practical wisdom for the living of faith. As you read through its short five chapters, 
you'll discover that the author does not mince words. The language is not often cryptic or mysterious. Instead, James uses crystal clear language, the language of everyday life, to call people out to live their discipleship actively. For James, faith is not only something that's personal or private matter. For James, our faith is something that we should be public about. Not public by speaking about it constantly, but rather public in the way we express our faith outwardly through our everyday lives and actions. Public in how we allow faith to impact and transform our relationships with God and with one another. Public in how we allow faith to move us, to motivate us, to help those who are in need around us. There are many different ways to view the book of James, but perhaps one helpful one is this, to view James as a rule of life. Now, everyone, all of us, we live by some sort of guidelines, whether we state those guidelines or whether unstated guidelines help rule our life. When you think about the world around us, there are rules everywhere we go. There are rules in the classroom. Our teachers work on those hard so that our students can learn when they're there. There are rules and etiquette in our workplaces, and there are practices that help prepare us to play sports or to participate in the performing arts, or there are even rules that govern our behavior when we take part in different social activities, when we go to a dinner party or when we're hanging out with friends in public places, there are rules, whether stated or unstated, all around us. What if we read the book of James as a rule of life that intends to help describe those practices, those rules, those guidelines that help lead to a healthy Christian community? James is a book of wisdom, but its wisdom is grounded in the practicalities of our everyday life, especially the practical pieces of our life that happen in a community that claims to follow the teachings and the example of Jesus. The writer of James wants us to listen to the wisdom that he offers. And not only listen, but the, to then act on what we have heard. That intent becomes clear as we approach the end of chapter 1, which we read today, which says you must be doers of the word and not only hearers who mislead themselves. Those who only hear wisdom and don't follow up that hearing with action, we're likely to forget what we have learned when we don't put what we've learned into action. I learned from some of my friends in seminary who had had a first career in teaching that most of us will forget things that we hear. About, they say about 90% of what you hear in a lecture or a sermon, though it might hurt my feelings on every on a day, about 90% you're gonna forget. It's not our most effective way of learning. There are different learning styles for all of us out there. Some of us learn by hearing, some of us learn better by writing, some of us learn better by seeing visuals. When you turn to visuals, the memory gets a little bit better. But my teacher friends, and they pointed to help, they pointed me to different scientific studies to help prove this. What they taught me is what really helps someone learn something is when you invite them to participate in it. Not when you tell them about how to do it, not even when you show them how to do it, but when you invite them to actually take something into their own hands and apply it, that's where our best learning happens. That's when we're likely to remember something. And so James leads us to this wisdom 2,000 years ago, probably before any other behavioral scientist thought they should study this. And James says, when you live out your faith, you remember what God has done for you more readily. When you take your faith and put it into action, it makes a bigger difference in your witness in the world than if you just preached about the love of Jesus. James teaches us faith is meant to be something that is active. And throughout the rest of this book, he'll offer us wisdom, guidance, advice, proverbs for how to put our faith into action in our everyday lives. 
James isn't the only person throughout the history of faith that's tried to offer to us as believers a rule of life, a way to live out our faith in the everyday. In the early, or excuse me, the late 4th and early 5th centuries, there's a person named Benedict of Nursia who wrote down a short list of guidelines by which Christian communities could live. You may wonder, why do we need lists like this? Why do we need guidelines for living out our faith? But when Benedict was alive, Christianity had not only become tolerated by the public, a very different atmosphere from what James or Jesus or any of the other disciples experienced. Faith, Christian faith had not become only tolerated, but it was now the official religion of the Roman Empire. And so what made Christianity unique anymore when it was accepted by so many people. Benedict looked at the world around him and recognized that true faith was lived out in action and not only in decree or creed or belief. And so Benedict offered to the world, to us, some rules and guidelines for what it means to live our faith out every day. You can even still read this in the rule of Benedict offered to the world. Throughout time, different stages of Christianity since Jesus walked the earth, different people of faith and leaders have tried to help each of us learn this true and essential part of our faith. That what we profess with our mouths must be lived by our lives for the grace of Jesus to be active in the world around us. I remember when I was at Bolivar, First United Methodist Church, and suddenly found myself with the much desirable problem of having many young people on Wednesday nights excited to learn about God, but that excitement bubbled over into some other activities, like talking constantly, or bugging one another, or playing too hard when we got in our favorite four-square tournaments. And so one day we sat down, and with the children, what we did is we made a rule of life. Of course, we didn't use those words for our elementary age children. What we did instead was we came up with God's house rules. We came up with the rules that govern our behavior, our actions, our choices when we came together in God's house. The students recognized what, we're, what the rules they had that were active at school. They recognized the rules they had that were active in their homes, and so we came together to make God's house rules. And these rules, those simple, helped improve our behavior, our community, our time together learning about Jesus. And these rules came from the children themselves, from them taking what they had learned about God's love and putting it into action and saying, I want this to be a place that's safe, where I come to learn about Jesus and have fun, what rules need to be in place? The first rule that came up was that you come to church to learn about God. You go to school to learn about different things. You go to home to have time with your family. Our purpose to coming to church was first to learn about God. And then second, they said their second house rule is that we want to see and respect our friends. That they came to have community together. That it wasn't only to learn about God, but to learn about God with their friends, with their community, with their peers. And that to do that, it had to be a place where they respected one another, where everyone felt safe and welcome. And then their last rule, after coming to learn about God, to see their friends, is a place they wanted to have fun, they said. We talked about all the things that we could do or not do to ensure that this was a fun place together. Perhaps not as sophisticated as Benedict's rule of life. Perhaps not as uh, elaborate or as helpful to adults as James' different pieces of wisdom and guidance in his book. But for our young people there, that rule of life, God's house rules, was something transformative. Because it helped them, in their own language, in their own words, in their own ability, put their faith into action. Each time we came together and each time we departed and went out into the world to be witnesses of Jesus. The temptation when we read the book of James, friends, is to read the text and to focus on all of his pieces of wisdom and proverbs and advice and to make ourselves a long to-do and not-to-do list. 
to see these negative commands as things to stay away from and to think that at each end of the day, if we can mark that we've stayed away from these things, then we've lived out our faith actively. We could take the book of James and make a whole bunch of rules of thou shalt not. Not be quick to speak, not be angry, not let our lives be sordid or wicked. It's easy to imagine James's advice rather than life-giving as a huge cosmic finger wagging itself at us saying, don't do that anymore. But when we're tempted to look at James as just a, rip, a list of do's and don'ts, as just a list of rules for the life of faith, we can come back to this first chapter. And remember where we started today with verse 17, that everything in our life of faith starts with a gift, a good gift from the hands of God. Our capacity to live as generous people, as those who help others in need, to give to our friends and our family, to give of our time and our life to the work of Jesus, all of that is made possible by the gift of grace from a faithful God in our lives. In our response to God's grace is made possible by God's love in the world around us. As we hear from another letter in the New Testament, 1 John, we are able to love, love one another, love the world, love even ourselves, because God first loved us. In the same way James teaches us, we are able to be generous, to be helpful, to be the hands and feet of Christ, because God first took on skin and came and lived among us and was generous with love and grace. And compassion. James wants us to look at the good gift of God's grace that we know in Jesus Christ and his example of life, ministry, and faith, and to imitate that, to be more like Jesus in our daily lives, so that others might see the grace of God active and living in us and through us. James is clear, this is not for our own benefit, this is for the benefit of God's kingdom. So when we are serious about our faith, when we want others to come and know the love of God, we have this opportunity to look in the mirror and to see how we are reflecting God's light in the world, or how we are not, and to adjust our behavior, our actions, our choices, according to what we find in the mirror that day. James tells us that we want to be not only hearers of God's word, but doers of God's word. That it's not enough to hear and believe. And even Jesus told us this too. He said, true faith is shown in our fruit, in our activity, in what we're able to share with the world. Now this doesn't mean that we have to prove to others, to ourselves, to God, that we are faithful or worthy of God's love. Remember, God's love and grace is a gift given to us at no price. But what it does help us do is take an honest inventory of our lives and say, if God's faith is truly active in my heart, how is my life different because of the love of Jesus living in me and through me? At the end of each day, perhaps that's the inventory we should go through of a checklist. Rather than thinking, did I do this or not do that? Perhaps we could ask ourselves instead, in what ways did I share God's love through my actions, words, and thoughts this day? And in what ways did I move away from God's love through my actions, words, or thoughts? Perhaps a simple tweaking of the questions we ask ourselves can present that mirror that James talks about that reflects to us not only God's love, but our ability to share God's love with others. Rather than forgetting what we see in that mirror, God's life of love and grace that has changed our hearts, our lives, rather than walking away from that mirror and forgetting all of the good things we have to thank God for, perhaps today we can remember what we see in that mirror of life. We can see God's love and grace written all over our lives. 
the places where God has been good and faithful, offer to us the best gifts and blessings we could imagine. And instead today, instead of forgiving when we turn away from the mirror, perhaps today we remember and we step out in faith to offer that to others. To let that reflection be the light of Christ living through us this week. So that others come to know this great love you and I have discovered together. When we come to this table, when we come to take the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Christ, we participate in the grace of God. And not only participate for our own benefit, but for the benefit of the world. In the liturgy we share before communion each time we celebrate it, there is a special prayer. It's a really important theological prayer. It even has a special name, epiclesis. You don't have to remember that, but it's been studied over and over again because what the epiclesis prayer does is that it is this crucial moment in our liturgy where we recognize that God's presence is here in the bread and wine, that in our community, as we celebrate this meal, it's more than just remembering God's activity. It's celebrating God's activity that's happening even now, even today, even in this meal that we share. That the Ecclesis prayer says, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Friends, when we pray that prayer, we're praying for more than God's spirit to be present here in this moment of worship. We are praying that through celebrating the sacrament of grace together, you and I, our hearts, our thoughts, our lives, <coughs> might also be transformed into the life the love, the hands, and the feet of Jesus Christ. We are praying a bold and audacious prayer that God might actually work through you and me to bring his kingdom of heaven here on earth. We are praying that we might become the body of Christ, not only gathered on Sunday morning, but the body of Christ sent out into the world each week to make a difference for the kingdom of God. It's a bold prayer. It's an audacious prayer. It's a prayer that fits perfectly with the book of James as he offers us practical wisdom for a life of faith that works, a life of faith that is active and engaged. Friends, as you walk throughout this week, as you seek to see the blessings of God scattered throughout your life, May you also seek to understand. May you ask God to present opportunities where you can share that blessing of wisdom, grace, and peace with others. Whether it's through a phone call to a friend you haven't seen in a while, to just ask them how they're doing. And the patience to be slow enough to speak that you might hear the real answer rather than the polite, I'm fine, thanks for asking. Whether it's a meal you provide for someone who's walking through a difficult moment of life, a health journey, or the grief of a lost loved one. Whether it's just a smile to a worker in a drive through fast food restaurant this week, knowing that smiles are not often offered to those who serve us day in and day out. In whatever small way you can share grace this week, May you embrace it and know that the small actions of grace equal big actions of love. And that when we allow the grace we receive today in our community worship together in this meal of grace, when we let that grace change our hearts and lives so that we are changed, we are doers of God's word, not merely hearers. May we do God's word for the glory of God here in this community. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, as we prepare our hearts to receive this meal of grace and love, I invite you to turn to page 12 in our United Methodist hymnal and to listen carefully to the words that we'll share together. 
from our invitation and confession to our thanksgiving and prayers. May these words shape our hearts and guide our lives that we might live active faith to share God's love with others. Friends, remember, it's Christ our Lord who invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will, broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You're invited into a moment of silent prayer to confess your sin to God. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It is right to give our thanks and praise. I always mess that part up because that's my favorite line. I'm so sorry. Let's try that again. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Friends, it is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By his baptism of suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take from this, all of you. Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these God's mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves to God in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit. On us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with confidence as children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will those who have uh, volunteered to help with communion please come forward? 
and the one who was whole became broken, so that we who are broken might become whole. You'll be invited in a few moments by our ushers to come forward. We'll have our choir come forward first. You're invited to come and receive this gift of grace, either by taking a piece of bread and dipping in the cup, or receiving one of our prepackaged elements, which are also gluten-free if that should be a need. In a few moments, come freely and know you are loved in this place. Thank you. 
gifts in many ways through song, through prayer. Through our giving of thanks, may we remember that the good gifts of God continue to pour out upon us, giving us inspiration and energy for every good act. May our lives this week yield a harvest of goodness and compassion as we go to be doers of God's word and truth. Giving thanks for God to God for the mystery of communion we've shared in together, this outpouring of God's grace. Let us join in our benediction prayer, and may this prayer lead us for faithful action this week. Let us pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm going to ask that you grab your faith we sing. That way we'll all be on the same page. <laughs> and turn to page 2068. And I'm going to ask Elizabeth to play it through all the way through one time. The words have accidentally been left off. Take joy, my king, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Elizabeth? Elizabeth? 